刻むでハモンのビート Back in 2019, I started my series in which I cleared up a large amount of misinformation in the JoJo series. I went through the first seven parts, along with some additional videos covering certain large topics of the series. However, there have been a lot of topics that I either neglected to cover, or that have only started to be discussed more recently, which are too small to get their own video. Other topics I want to cover are ones that I already went over, but with which I was apparently not thorough enough. Due to the nature of the series, making the video results in people commenting, which brings in a ton of new ideas. I did predict this, however, and tried my best to survey the waters a bit by asking the audience ahead of time for topics. But there are still some that ended up slipping through the cracks. So today I'll be covering the Iraqi Forgot topics that I missed along the way. One of the biggest ones I've seen recently, and possibly the most insane Iraqi Forgot topic I've ever seen, goes as follows. In one of my videos, I happened to mention the fact that the baby saved on board the boat at the end of part one is Lisa Lisa. Anyone with even a basic understanding of the story would know this, since Lisa Lisa directly explains this in part two. However, in the comments of that video, I received a ton of comments saying, but if Lisa Lisa was the baby and she's the mother of Joseph, then that would mean Joseph and all of his descendants aren't actually related to Jonathan and therefore shouldn't have Joestar birthmarks. This has to be one of the most insane things I've ever heard on multiple levels. These people somehow seem to forget the existence of George Joestar II, whose backstory was extensively shown in Part 2, and is one of the most integral characters to the backstories of Joseph and Lisa Lisa. And the fact that Arina was already pregnant with him at the end of Part 1, which couldn't have been made any clearer by the narration from the end of that part. Just as confusing as when I get comments that think they're correcting me, telling me that the baby was actually George II. I presume they think that Lisa Lisa was actually Arina's baby? Once again, this was directly conflicted with by what was clearly stated in part two. How an amount of misinformation like this can even be possible says a lot about the reading level that some JoJo fans possess. I've received some questions regarding the sand copy of Dio that Iggy made in Part 3. In my Part 3 video, I said that Iggy based his sand copy off of the photo of Dio. I received comments asking how Iggy was able to replicate the pants when the photo is only from the waist up. Now this doesn't exactly make sense, since not only are the pants visible in the spirit photograph of Dio, but if you look at the manga, you can see that the pants Dio was wearing as a sand copy is different from the pants he was wearing earlier, so they were never replicated perfectly in the first place. Others have even asked me how Iggy was able to replicate Dio's face, but as you can clearly see, Iggy did not replicate Dio's face and it is obscured with shadow. The end of part 3 famously shows Jotaro using his stand to stop time since it is the same kind of stand as the world. Many people are confused by this, asking, how's this possible? I've been over this topic before, but I think it's worth going further in depth. Star Platinum and the world are far from the only similar stands out there. Hermit Purple is nearly identical to the stand of Jonathan's body which Dio used. The Darby brothers both have nearly identical functioning stands, with the younger Darby having an additional mind-reading ability. The rats in Part 4 both had identical stands, and in Part 7, the Boom Boom family had three stands with the same ability. Jotaro and Dio had a similar stand due to their psychic link through Jonathan's body. However, some people chose to say their own explanation as to why the stands were similar, citing an example from earlier in the part. I've gotten a lot of comments saying that when Jotaro drew the tarot cards to name his stand in the beginning, he first drew the World card, Avdol said it was already taken, and then he drew the Star card. Now, I was confused as to how I got so many comments saying the same very specific scenario, since no such scene exists in Part 3 or any of its adaptations. I finally ended up tracking this down to a YouTube video which does this edit as a joke. Not only does the description of the video clearly state that it's an edit, but the edit within the video is incredibly obvious. 
The video jumps to a shot of Dio from dozens of episodes later, and has Avdol comically saying, oh shit, in a completely different font. But somehow, JoJo fans are dense enough to watch this and literally think it's a scene from the show. Although it probably shouldn't come as a surprise that a lot of self-identified JoJo fans out there probably only watch the show through clips on YouTube. The most embarrassing thing about this particular one is that it comes from people on the anti-forgetting side of the argument. They're just spreading around stuff that's completely wrong. I'd prefer if people said nothing rather than muddy the waters like this, even if they're on my side. Another big topic comes from the end of Part 3, when Holly is cured of her disease. People often ask why defeating Dio caused her stand to disappear, and not the stands of the other Joe stars. In reality though, Holly's stand didn't just cease to exist, rather it returned to a dormant state. When Dio used the stand arrow on Jonathan's body, it sent out a kind of distress signal to the other Joe stars through their psychic link. This caused stands to start to awaken in Jonathan's descendants. The stands didn't just appear right away, however. They gradually started forming over the course of about a year. For Jotaro, he started to notice the effects of his stand, but didn't fully gain control of it until the fight in the police station. For Holly, her stand was dormant for a while before fully appearing. At the beginning of the part, she is clearly already a stand user, since she is able to see Star Platinum. However, her stand is not fully formed yet. Eventually, her stand was forced out before she was ready, since it was reacting to the signal from Jonathan. Jotaro was strong enough to use the stand once it appeared, so he had no issues. But this same effect on Holly caused her to fall ill. After Dio was beaten and the distress signal ended, her stand had no need to be out anymore, and returned to how it was at the beginning of the part. Josuke was also affected by the same disease as Holly, and as we know, he later was able to use the stand perfectly fine. We don't know exactly when Josuke started using Crazy Diamond, we just know that it started sometime when he was a kid. Either his stand became dormant and he awakened it at a later date, or he was inspired enough by his savior to be able to use his stand normally. Keep in mind that even with a dormant stand, the ability can still be used. We can see that effect through Giorno, who would have also been affected by the disease. As a young child, his stand was dormant but still usable. It didn't fully awaken until he was 15, shortly before Part 5. Jotaro and Joseph were already able to use their stands, so they remained as they were. Holly's stand didn't disappear, it just returned to what she was capable of using at that time. Stands completely disappearing was never part of the equation. One weird string of comments I've gotten came from my Part 4 Differences video. In it, I point out the new addition of the other Morio stand users hidden in a crowd shot. These were Okuyasu, Keicho, Yukiko, Hazamada, and Rohan. For some reason, however, I got at least 30 comments saying they spotted Polnareff in the crowd. Despite the fact that it's clearly Keicho, and that they're watching a video which is telling them that the people in the crowd are future stand users from Part 4, and that all of the other people there are clearly from Part 4, and the fact that Polnareff isn't even in Part 4, and it would make no sense for him to be foreshadowed there. Another common topic in Part 4 involves the Nijimura brother's father. Keicho Nijimura was searching for a stand user to kill his father out of pity. I've gotten a ton of questions asking me why Okuyasu didn't just kill him instead. With his stand in the hand, which can erase matter, killing the father would presumably be an easy job. First of all, Okuyasu has never shown a desire to kill his father. And second, Okuyasu himself has said that he has no idea where things erased by the hand go. For all he knows, the things he erases may just be appearing in another dimension, where the father would just regenerate and continue suffering. Others ask why Joseph's Haman wasn't used to kill the father. Since he was mutated by the flesh bud and combined with Dio's cells, some think that Haman may be capable of killing him. First of all, I think it was made clear that that aspect of Dio's vampiric cells was eliminated when it combined with the father's, since he walks in sunlight without any issue. So I doubt the Haman would have any effect on him like it would on a vampire. Second, by the time Joseph arrived at Morio, they were long past trying to kill the father and wanted to find a cure instead. 
I've gotten a few comments asking me how Hayato was able to see Killer Queen during the final battle. This is an easy one, since the answer to this is that he was never seeing Killer Queen. Hayato himself states that he is unable to see what's going on, but that he's predicting Kira's general actions from his expression. In the spin-off series, The Spokushibe Rohan, we can see various instances of modern technology, such as tablets or smartphones. Many have asked how this is possible, since Part 4 takes place in 1999. This is cleared up by the fact that we are shown Rohan's age, which is now 27, putting these chapters several years after Part 4. The exception to this would be the first chapter, At a Confessional, which is said to take place during Rohan's hiatus during and shortly after Part 4. This was expanded upon in the OVA adaptation, which included a scene of Koichi talking about his upcoming trip to Italy, placing this story somewhere around the year 2000. Speaking of OVAs, here's a gripe I have with how I've seen many JoJo fans use the term. OVA stands for Original Video Animation. The term refers to an anime that is released straight to video or DVD, as opposed to being broadcast on TV or shown in theaters. However, people seem to use the term OVA interchangeably with any supplementary or spin-off material. For example, I've seen the JoJo spin-off manga Dead Man's Questions referred to as an OVA, despite the fact that it is not animated. I've also seen the Rohan TV drama referred to as an OVA, despite the fact that not only is it not animated, but it was also broadcast on TV. The only OVAs we've had so far in JoJo is the recent Rohan OVA animated by David Production, and the old Stardust Crusaders OVAs from 1993 and 2000. In Part 5, we were shown that after Palmareff attempted to go after Diavolo, he was gravely injured by him and went into hiding. I've seen a ton of comments asking why Polnareff did not contact Jotaro or the Speedwagon Foundation during this time. This is despite the narration of the manga saying that he was unable to contact Jotaro, due to Pashone having control over all communication in and out of Italy. All of his attempts to reach outside the country were blocked, and any attempt now that he's in hiding would lead to his cover being blown. So he stayed in hiding until he found people within the country capable of defeating Diavolo. For a similar topic, many have asked why Koichi didn't tell Jotaro about Giorno near the beginning of the part. Jotaro had sent Koichi there to investigate Giorno, and to retrieve a skin sample from him to determine if he is a descendant of Dio. Koichi never ended up getting that sample. This was explained within the story itself. After Jotaro was made aware that Giorno was a stand user, he immediately told Koichi to stay away from him. After hearing about Giorno's ability and his recent change to blonde hair, Jotaro became certain that this was Dio's son, and no longer needed Koichi to collect a sample. After Koichi learned about the presence of a stand arrow in Italy, he tried to contact Jotaro, but was convinced not to by Giorno, who knew Pashone would likely go after Koichi. So, for the same reason as Polnareff, Koichi refrained from contacting Jotaro right away, and most likely told him after he was safely back home. By that time, the story of Part 5 would have already been resolved, since it only takes place over the course of about a week. During the Grateful Dead fight, the characters slowly begin to age due to Prosciutto's ability. The ability works based on body heat, with those who are warmer aging faster. Since Trish is a woman, her body heat is naturally lower compared to the others, which Prosciutto tried to use to his advantage to avoid killing her. Some people ask why Trish was not affected much by the aging, while another woman on the train was shown to have aged more. First of all, this woman was clearly shown to be older than Trish since she was a mother. Second, Trish had access to the ice cubes in the fridge, which further slowed down her aging. Also, Grateful Dead's aging ability seemingly spreads through the mist that is emitted throughout the area during his attack. The woman passenger would have been exposed to this mist much earlier than Trish was, since she was sitting out in the open, as opposed to being hidden like the gang was. I've seen others ask why the characters didn't open the fridge to stay cold. These people don't seem to know how a fridge works. A fridge doesn't just pump out cold air, it cools by absorbing the heat from inside the fridge. If you just leave the door to a fridge open, it would be cold for a little bit, but since the door is open, it's no longer able to remove the heat. Eventually, the fridge would just start heating up the room, since it's just sitting there running electricity. 
I've also got a comment asking why they didn't put the others inside the fridge, despite the fridge being downright tiny. Also in part 5, the stand talking head took control of Narancia, causing him to unintentionally tell nothing but lies to the other characters. Some ask why Narancia didn't just say the opposite of what he meant, so that what he said would be different. This is not how the stand works. Talking Head doesn't reverse what you say, it makes you lie. Lying on purpose is still lying. So if Narancia lied, it would still come out as a lie. Another fight in Part 5 involved the characters entering the mirror world with Aluso's stand, Man in the Mirror. According to Aluso, the only living things that can enter the mirror world have to be brought in by the stand itself. Some people have said this is wrong, since we see the crows on the ground after they were affected by Fugo's virus. These people somehow didn't understand that these crows were clearly said to be dead from the virus, which is the reason they appeared. The second they stopped living, they were no longer considered living, so they appear in the mirror world. Near the end of Part 5, Polnareff tells the group about his experience with the arrow, and through flashback we see it on the wall in his house where he was in hiding. Some people were confused by this, and asked how the beetle arrow, which in Part 6 Dio was shown to have owned previously, ended up in this random house to be found by Polnareff. I have no idea how anyone could think something this ridiculous, when Polnareff clearly states that he found this arrow in Egypt, and brought it with him to Italy. Another one from Part 5. In my Part 5 Differences video, I mentioned how the anime removed the scene of Koichi using Echo's Act 1 to look for Joro. I got a lot of comments asking how it's possible for him to suddenly use a previous act. However, this has never been a problem for Koichi since using previous acts of a stand is completely normal. He is shown using Act 1 after he had already gotten Act 2 multiple times in Part 4, such as during the Red Hot Chili Pepper fight and in the Ghost Alleyway. The only other stand to have acts is Tusk in Part 7, and Johnny is shown to be using previous acts all the time. In Part 6, Jotaro sends Jolene a fragment of a stand arrow inside of a pendant in order to awaken her stand in the prison. The pendant also includes a transmitter, intended to be used in Jolene's rescue. There seems to be some confusion when it comes to this pendant, with some people claiming it was never seen again after a certain point, and that the plot point surrounding it was dropped. This is blatantly untrue, and the path the pendant took is actually quite clear. It started with Jolene receiving the pendant in the visitation room. After she was pierced by the arrow inside, she threw it into the drain. Later, we are shown that Aramis found the pendant, and was also pierced by the arrow. This is who we saw carrying it at the end of the third chapter. Then, she sold it to Gwess, who also got her stand from it. After the fight with Goo Goo Dolls, Gwess gave the pendant back to Jolene. Later, when Jolene met with Jotaro, she threw the pendant back at him. Later, he gives it back to her, and it is last seen being dropped into Jotaro's pocket. So, it was taken to the Speedwagon Foundation when they took Jotaro's body. Another one I've seen from Part 6 was people claiming Jolene was capable of seeing the future at the beginning of the part, and that this was never used again. It took me a while to realize what the hell they were talking about, but it seems they're referring to Jolene unconsciously using her ability to hear through her string. This starts in the first chapter, when Jolene is in the prison van with Hermes. Her string hears the driver in the front cabin say when they'll be arriving. He later repeats this to the back, confirming what she heard earlier. This happened again when Hermes was being accosted by the guards, when it is revealed to be happening through her string. She continues to use this power of her string throughout the part, such as when she hears Emporio through it later. So no, at no point was Jolene predicting the future. One comment I featured way back in my Part 6 video had someone asking why Emporio had the Joestar birthmark. Obviously, this comment is completely ridiculous, since no such thing ever happens in the story of Part 6. I believe the comment may have been referring to Weather getting the birthmark, and since I already ended up explaining that in the video, I left the comment in the intro segment. However, this somehow caused multiple commenters to come out who did believe Emporio had a birthmark. I'm absolutely dumbfounded as to how this is even possible. It's like they gaslighted themselves into believing that this actually happened, and then started to make explanations for it in the comments. 
This must say something about how JoJo fans retain information. Like with that previous YouTube clip I spoke about, it shows the extent to which some people's understanding of JoJo comes from what people say about it online, or from random YouTube clips, rather than what it should come from, which is reading the actual series itself. A common topic I've seen across all parts has related to stands interacting with physical objects. Many people point to examples of stands being affected by non-stand attacks, and say this is contradictory. I'd like to finally just lay this entire topic to rest. Stands exist on a spectrum of tangibility. Stands have been shown to lose their opacity to enter a ghost-like state, and phase in and out of objects. At other times, however, a stand needs to attack, and so they become more solid. Let's say a stand wants to break through a wall. If the stand is strong, like Star Platinum for instance, its punch would destroy the wall. But let's consider a stand that's too weak to break through. Obviously, since the wall is tougher, the stand would be stopped by the wall, at least when it's in its solid form. Now, let's look at this process in reverse. If an object is flying towards a stand user, and they use the stand to defend themselves, they obviously would not be making their stand intangible, they'd want to make their stand as solid as they can to block the hit. So just like how if a stand hits a physical object, it gets damaged, these interactions can take place in the opposite direction as well. So yes, stands can be damaged by physical objects, but only if they are taking their solid form. Some people are also confused when it comes to the visibility of stands. I've gotten tons of comments asking about scenarios such as Anne and the Sailor seeing strength despite it being a stand. Others say that since Love Deluxe is a stand, people shouldn't be able to see Yukiko's hair. This comes from a clear misunderstanding of stand categories. The traditional idea of a stand is a ghostly type, something like Star Platinum, which appears and disappears at will. These types of stands cannot be seen by non-stand users. However, plenty of other stands are a completely different type, which are bound stands. These are stands which are bound to a physical object, and can be seen by everyone, including non-stand users. Strength and Wheel of Fortune were both shown to be bound to a physical boat and car, respectively. Anubis is bound to a sword, Toph is bound to a book, Superfly is bound to a transmission tower, and so on. In a series with a huge number of stands that either exist within physical objects, or are made up of physical matter, I have no idea how anyone can still be confused when non-stand users see them. There's literally so many of these stands that it would take way too long to list them out in this video. In Part 7, there's been some confusion involving Hot Pants Stand, Cream Starter. Cream Starter takes the form of a spray bottle which can spray flesh. She also has the ability to absorb flesh to refill the spray. People have claimed that she was only shown absorbing flesh at the beginning of the part, and that later on, this restriction was removed. In my Part 7 video, I showed that this is not the case, since she can be seen absorbing flesh even in the final arc. However, some were not satisfied by this, and now they claim that she needs to absorb flesh every single time she uses her stand. I have no idea how anyone could think something like this, which is so obviously not true. Apparently, they think her stand ability is literally a one-way transfer of flesh from one source to another, with no time in between. Something like that almost reminds me of one of the Aphex Twins abilities in Part 8. This is simply not how Cream Starter works. Even back in her very first appearance, she is immediately shown spraying flesh without having been shown absorbing it. Cream Starter obviously stores the flesh inside of it for when it needs to be used. If she's low on flesh, she absorbs some more. If she already has flesh stored, why would she be absorbing it? It's like if these people saw a scene where Mista was out of ammo and needed to reload his gun to shoot, and then, in a later completely unrelated scene when he already has ammo, he shoots his gun. These people would then say, wait, what happened to Mista needing to reload his gun every time he shoots? When he clearly just got more ammo off screen, and had his gun already fully loaded. This same basic concept obviously applies to Cream Starter. 
In the scenes in which Hot Pants is shown using her spray, she obviously already has ammo stored up. Still in Part 7, here's a topic I apparently didn't give enough of a detailed explanation to. When the alternate universe Diego uses the world to stop time, you can see that his horse is in a different location after the time stop. People were confused by this, and asked me why Diego's horse is capable of moving in stop time. I explained this quite plainly in my Part 7 video, by saying that during the time stop, Diego moved his frozen horse to a different location to continue riding, much like how Polnareff was repeatedly moved down the stairs in Part 3. For some reason, this was not a good enough explanation and I was berated by dozens of commenters telling me that it was ridiculous to say that Diego would be capable of moving his horse. They say that Dio would be easily capable of something like this with his strength as a vampire, but that it is ridiculous to say that Diego could move the horse, since he is a normal human. These people somehow seem to forget about the fact that Dio has access to the world one of the physically strongest stands in the series, with a stand of comparable strength being able to bend steel bars with ease. The world would be able to reposition the horse without any issue, and Diego wouldn't even have to move a muscle. And that's without even mentioning that objects within stopped time don't even have weight to begin with. People and objects are repeatedly shown floating in place in stopped time, and are able to be pushed around with no difficulty at all. So to take it even farther, Diego didn't even need to use the world in this circumstance. He probably did, since that would be faster to fit within the time stop, but still. I really have no clue how anyone could not understand such a simple concept. However, I've gotten some more comments about this topic, which somehow take the insane approach of saying that Diego's horse actually is able to be ridden in stop time, since Diego is making contact with it. For starters, we see other panels where the horse is clearly frozen in stop time, even with Diego on top of it. Second, this idea is completely unfounded with everything we know about the world. Since every other time it has made contact with a frozen being, they have not been conscious. When Dio moved Polnareff down the stairs, Polnareff obviously did not become aware of the time stop, he stayed frozen in place. Things are obviously movable by Dio during the time stop, since he can apply force to them, and they'll move for a bit before halting. But this has never been shown to actually unfreeze an object, let alone make a horse fully unfrozen and rideable. And that was every extra Araki forgot I could think of. I doubt if I'll be able to make another video like this with the amount of questions that are probably left, but you never know. I don't plan on making a full Part 8 debunking video until the story is actually over, but I have already gone over my thoughts on Part 8 relating to this topic in a previous video. I also may cover some of the larger topics in a fully in-depth video, much like I did with King Crimson, Heaven, and the death and revival mechanics of JoJo. If you have an idea for a video similar to those, leave it in the comments below. Hopefully I managed to clear up the remaining misinformation I missed along the way. If you want to be updated on new videos, join the Hum and Beat Discord using the link in the description. To receive rewards like Discord perks and some uncut videos, support the channel on Patreon. And finally, for future videos, subscribe to the channel. Thank you for watching. This is the part of the video where I thank my $5 and up patrons. Thank you to Norton the Lich, Alex Ramirez, Raziana, Anasui Hat, Doorbell, Cloudy, Monkman, Ashton Joseph Miller, Crayon, Jesper Jansen, Austin Nino, Rigo Vids, and Zucato. Also, apologies to Rigo Vids, who I accidentally left out of a few previous videos.